Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar, Wrestling the Bear. Does the uh, macro environment have the deals market in a hold? Presented in partnership between the Legal 500 and Evershed Sutherland. Uh, my name is Alan Cohen. I'm a research editor at the Legal 500. And uh, before I hand over the webinar to our panelists, I'll give a brief uh, introduction of today's topic. Inflation, uh, interest rates, supply issues, these are just some of the factors putting downward pressure on the deals market. Uh, in this webinar, we will discuss the impact of inflation, the current state of liquidity uh, in the debt and equity markets, uh, and the uh, direction of valuations. The panelists will also discuss how corporates are using m and to navigate supply issues. The trends we're seeing from corporates uh, looking to reorganize their businesses and the type of market we're likely to see in 2023. Uh, but first, let me introduce Richard Morton, who will lead the conversation today. Uh, Richard is a partner and co-head of the Global Corporate and M&A team at Evershed Sutherland, and is a member of the firm's technology, media, and communications, and healthcare groups. Uh, he has extensive experience of all areas of mergers and acquisitions and private equity, including uh, advising Tinopolis on its 45 million uh, British pound acquisition uh, by way of scheme of arrangement by Trivian Partners, acting for Gresham and Newco for its 110 million British pounds acquisition of Bets Global Limited with operations in 11 jurisdictions, uh, including the US, Brazil, Mexico, China, Indonesia, Russia, Poland, uh, Switzerland, and South Africa, acting for Hutton Collins on uh, the 260 million British pound secondary buyout of healthcare at home. And I mean, I could, I could carry on, I mean, acting for uh, management and UCO on the acquisition of IDIS Limited, uh, which is a uh, medical distribution business uh, operating principally in the UK front and Germany. I mean, Richard, I could, I could literally carry on for a long time here. Uh, but I'm conscious of time. <laughs> yeah. I'll hand over to you in a moment, Richard, but before that, uh, I would like to let our audience know that the session is interactive. So yeah, if you have any question uh, at any point during the webinar, uh, please submit them using the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen, and we will put them to, um, to the panel once the presentation is over. Uh, okay, now, Richard, I'm handing this over to you. Feel free to and you know introduce your topic further. Introduce Samantha Thompson, Richard Booth, and Marcus Taylor, the uh, three panelists who are joining you, and uh, please get us on the way. Alan, thank you for that um, uh, introduction. Um, but uh, obviously what I'm very uh, delighted to have is um, three fantastic panelists jo joining us today. We obviously are living in interesting times. Uh, we seem to say that every year uh, going, uh, I remember a few years ago, uh, life felt a little bit more stable post-financial crash. Uh, cle clearly Brexit, then a pandemic. Uh, now the situation we've, we've had through 2022 with Ukraine, supply issues, et cetera. So we live in challenging and interesting times. And I think that's why it's really important that, you know, we, we do think and reflect on, on those drivers and themes coming out of, as we look out of the back of 22 uh, into 2023. So delighted to have, uh, our, so on our panel, um, joined by Samantha Thompson, who is head of uh, legal global M&A at uh, Anglo-American, started her career at um, Slaughter and May, time at uh, Linklaters uh, and PwC. Uh, so welcome, uh, Samantha. Uh, also joined by uh, Richard Booth, partner at uh, Inflection and co-heads uh, the uh, industrials team uh, at, at Inflection and previously started his career at LEK uh, Consulting uh, and then spent time at Arl Partners as well. Our capital, sorry. Uh, we're also um, delighted to be joined by Marcus uh, Taylor, uh, uh, a um, managing director at Lazard, uh, started his uh, career previously at Greenhill. So thank you all to the panelists. Uh, lots to get through and, and lots of, of, of issues to, to, to cover and, and debate. Um, so first things first, I'll start and turn to, to Marcus. Um, lots of commentary in the recent past about when we're going to when we're going to see peak inflation is peak inflation coming uh, into the us how that interplays with interest rates um and is it fair to say that if and when we find that inflationary environment stabilizing that will be a trigger for 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 a re-energization of, of the m a market so very good um well good morning everybody and richard thank you uh for that very interesting question uh, as you 
highlighted in your introduction, we're in a very dynamic environment. I think inflation is definitely a factor, but it's only one of a, a small number of considerations which really come into play in terms of driving M&A volumes and activity. Um, if we start and sort of really think about what are the key uh, ingredients that we need in order to catalyze significant levels of M&A activity, the first one really is around confidence. And that's confidence of buyers um, around the prospects of their own business and the confidence in the prospects of the business that they're looking to buy. And in the current environment where we are, and inflation is one element of that, but in the current environment, there's uncertainty about the prospects for individual businesses. And so you know, that uncertainty makes it more challenging for people to think, now's the moment I'm going to take the leap uh, to pursue that you know, transformational acquisition. Um, Another dynamic which you and uh, the, the participants in the panel will, will know very well is that in order to get to a deal, you need buyers and sellers to agree with each other about what's a reasonable price. And in a dynamic environment where it's you know hard enough for one party to figure out what the future looks like and establish what the right valuation for a company is, it's also hard for their counterparty. And so you know getting them to uh, agree in the middle is is tricky. Um, now, as inflation calms down, hopefully we'll get to a point where uh, that also feeds into a bit more stability in terms of company valuations and the expectations around prospects. That allows us to um, you know, create conditions for more deals to be done. The other major thing that we need, so confidence agreement between buyers and sellers, is around the availability and the cost of capital. And you know, one thing that inflation has done is driven up the cost of capital. If you look at, for example, the cost of uh, credit for a triple B rated issuer, so, uh, you know, sort of borderline between investment grade and, and non-investment grade, the cost of borrowing for those companies has increased fivefold since 12 months ago. So the equation that goes into establishing, you know, am I going to pursue this acquisition or not, has changed dramatically over that period. Um, I'm sure Richard will comment from a private equity perspective as well. Uh, you know, the cost of leverage finance is slightly more than double uh, across Europe. In fact, if you're in the UK, it's even you know a little bit higher than that. Um, and as a result, uh, volumes of leverage credit issuance are down 75% this year over last year. Uh, so at the moment, we don't have uh, uh, you know sort of free and available. Uh, capital broad-based uh, to fund a lot of M&A activity. That's one of the reasons why deal volumes in 2022 are about 25, 26% below last year. And a lot of that sort of dip is really weighted to the second half of this year. Okay, Marcus, thank you. Um, Sam, I might just turn to, to you. I mean, given um, your, your business, inflationary pressures, um, your take, and I mean, obviously Marcus makes some really good broader points and obviously just that basic importance of confidence for anything and everything that we do. But in that inflationary environment, from, from your business perspective, your feel for and confidence in thinking about M&A, your, your, your views on that? Yeah, and I think also building on the point that you made earlier, we've had a significant number of so-called black swan events in the last five years, Brexit, COVID, Ukraine, and then in the UK, government changes, the Queen dying. And I think, yes, that was all uncertainty, but now we're more used to dealing with that uncertainty. So it's almost like these, these new events are going to happen, but actually we're slightly re reacting in a more calm way because we've come through other unknowns quite recently. Um, I think the next one is, you know, the energy transition. No one's done an energy transition before, but hey, we're all going to have to do it. So the, uh, yes, confidence, but I sort of think we're better with keeping that confidence, even though there are these pres pressures, inflationary or otherwise. I think the other thing, and maybe we'll get onto this later. So I spent 10 years working in Hong Kong, as you, as you sort of alluded to at the beginning, part of that during the financial crisis. And whilst in the news in Europe and the deal making was quite depressed, actually, you know, deal making was still going on. Deal makers want deals to get done. So I think the activity shifts. There are different bits of the globe, different sectors, different people who are optimistic. And so 
yeah, to me, I think deal makers get deals done sort of almost whatever the environment there is. Interesting. Thank you. I mean, Richard, your views, um, your, you know, obviously in terms of that inflationary environment, confidence, is it right to say that if we find that stabilizing, you know, with a, an investor hat on, obviously, but also looking at, at, at I guess, a, also a portfolio where you're thinking of exits, um, when does that come into play? And, and to the point that Sam's alluding to, which is actually, we get used, I think, that resilience in the market. We're getting used to dealing with issues. And when we see that stabilization, because of being able to move forward and look forward quicker, maybe in the world we're living in today, does that then give us the confidence to, do you think that would give you the confidence to be pushing on with M&A? Yeah, I mean, so, uh, and thank you for, for having me on the panel today, uh, Richard. I, I think um, I mean, it's an interesting time. I think inflation easing will certainly be uh, a factor that will help uh, bring deal flow back into the market. Um, but as, as Marcus was saying, I don't think it's the only factor. I mean, some of the stats that Marcus was saying there, you know, 30% plus or minus fall in, in volumes as a result year to date. I think we should remember that 2021 was an exceptional year for, for deal doers. So we were coming off a, a very, very high level, I would say, albeit it's been a quite rapid um, ramp down in deal flow, I think, as we've, as we've come out of summer. Um, I think it also depends on the size of M&A that's being done. Um, as Marcus alluded to, debt debt is an issue um, at the moment, and I think certainly if you split up the market into the large cap market versus the mid market, the large cap market is a lot quieter. Whereas I think in the mid market level, there are still deals being done. To Sam's point, um, deal do deal doers do want to to do deals. Um, so I think that that part of the market will continue to take over, albeit I accept kind of at, at lower rates. And I think we'll also see different types of deals being done. Um, you know, Marcus alluded to the buyer and the seller dynamics um, being potentially kind of misaligned at this point. And I think standard auction processes might not be as prevalent as they were over the last 24 months or so. And you'll have situations which are almost quasi bilateral discussions of where there's a knowledgeable buyer that knows the asset well and that will come to some sort of arrangement. Um, on a on a more quieter basis, I would say. And another aspect of we're seeing is some of the deals might not be majority deals. Um, so Inflection's got one of the largest uh, dedicated minority funds in Europe. And certainly that part of our investment strategy has seen an increase in deal flow over the last six months as business entrepreneurs or corporates or other private equity houses, other private equity houses um, are open to having a discussion which allows them to de-risk their balance sheet or personal wealth, uh, but equally still stay in control of business uh, and hopefully kind of crystallise a higher value in due course, but take someone on board as part of that journey. So I, I think the deal environment will continue, as Sam said, but I think there'll be different types of deals going, going forward. Okay, but there's, there's a pricing issue around debt, but debt availability for that mid-market, but, but, but more stretched and challenging at the... At the, at the higher end, that would be your your view. Yeah, and it's not to say the pricing's not changed at the mid market level; it, it has as well. But I think with the with the credit funds that are available in the market now versus the you know two thousand and eight two thousand and nine period, there's a different um, avenue to securing debt for the mid market, which I think is is still more open. Given again, those debt funds are are deal doers themselves and will want to get deals done. When you make an interesting point, I mean, thinking about buyers, sellers, um, valuations, finding that equilibrium, but also good assets. As we go into 2023, obviously, I guess there's going to be sectors where people are excited, not excited, um, which we might come on to a bit more detail later. But, you know, you talk about auctions. I mean, we've definitely seen also where for good assets, processes are very aggressive. Do, would you still see that that would be the case into 23? I mean, good businesses will attract good valuations, and I think that theme will will stay, uh, given there's a lot of capital out there trying to find high quality assets. And generally, in, in tougher times, there's always a flight to quality. Um, so I think that that theme will continue to um, to see through. I think from a from a price correction aspect of deal doing, I think if you look at the public markets, uh, there's been a, a quicker price correction there than what we've seen in the private markets. 
Uh, and I think that ultimately will will drip through, um, but will just take a bit longer than what we've seen in the public markets. That's interesting. Thank you. I mean, Marcus, your take have you get have you got a view around that, around auctions, around valuations, um, and also what you're seeing in the capital markets the interplay there with we're talking about access to liquidity debt markets, but what about what about the public markets as well? If any comment there? Yeah, I think um Richard's raised some fantastic points there, actually, and just to to just reinforce and support those I fully agree in terms of the scale of transaction. So the deal data does show that actually deal volumes in terms of number across 2022 across Europe are down about 3% versus total value of deals down 26%. So you can see that big shift. Actually, plenty of small deals are getting done. Um, and interestingly, and this that which I'm sure Richard will enjoy, uh, private equity deals as a proportion of total M&A are the highest this year than they have ever been across Europe. 38% of all transactions executed by private equity um, buyers. Normally, in the post-2013 period, that's been in the low 30%. So private equity, particularly at the smaller end, extremely active. Uh, the comment around the bilaterals versus processes, I 100% agree with that. Um, the amount of time you know, to get the buyer and the seller to agree, the amount of time that you have to invest to really get both sides on the same page about what the prospects are and what the valuation should be, just requires a lot more of investment of uh, of time with that potential buyer. And so, you know, generally running auctions with 20 people throwing bids in, you know, that just doesn't really work uh, at the moment, unless it is, as you said, Richard, for, for an absolutely um, stellar asset. Um, in terms of just thinking about your, coming to your question, Richard, about public markets and Richard's point about valuations, they're having adjusted pretty quickly. I think uh, that's very accurate. Uh, you know, if you look at just as a very broad base measure, the P multiple of the S&P 500, which people look at for better or worse, and that's down around 20% over the last uh, 12 months. Um, but it's still above long term averages. So it's actually, you know, there's been quite a big adjustment, but it's not necessarily inverted commas cheap today. Um, and I think until or unless valuations fall a bit further, you know, I'm not, and I think the same is true in Europe too, but um, I'm not sure we're going to see a huge raft of public to private type transactions. Um, in terms of uh, other sort of types of deal that we might see today that we haven't seen so much of over the last five years, um, equity merger type transactions, particularly on the public markets, where you know, there's less concern about absolute valuation and relative valuation is the you know the more relevant benchmark, and so that might be a bit easier for companies to get their heads around. It also might mean you know less levering up of balance sheets and more you know bringing together two strong businesses to to maintain a strong balance sheet. Um, you asked the question about liquidity and availability of capital in the equity markets. Um, you know, there will be uh, the equity markets will support deals with you know good companies who are have a strong rationale for a transaction that that will always be the case. But we have seen pretty big outflows from equity funds over the course of this year. And so, you know, I don't think the and particularly given that valuation dynamic that I just described about, you know, relative to long term averages. Um, and I'm not sure just yet we're going to see you know, the big uh, long only funds dipping their hands in their pockets and supporting, you know, equity raises to fund M&A transactions too aggressively just yet. Thank you. Um, Sam, thoughts on, on, I mean, obviously, presumably, you don't, or, you know, any views you've got around debt or but the need for you to, to, to have debt to fund deals, maybe not so pertinent, but in terms of valuations, your view, you know, how, how you would be thinking or the need for an adjustment to get that baseline on valuations for you to be sort of got more of a focus on M&A or thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think I would, I would just echo what Marcus and Richard have said is that it's just got more complicated and a bit more difficult to agree those valuations either internally but also externally. And so things just take a lot more time. There's also more kind of process around capital allocation. And, and you, know, you know, again, for a business like ours, if we're going to outlay or buy an asset, that's an asset, you know, so we operate mines, that's an asset that's in the portfolio for 10, 15, 20 years. So you've got to be very sure that this is an asset that you want, but is it also an asset that's going to be relevant in 10, 15, 20 years 
when the demand for commodities is actually changing, when society in 15 years time might actually look quite diff different. So it's not only, I suppose, the valuation points, it's actually taking into account the societal and geopolitical changes at the same time as well, that makes those decisions at the moment more difficult than perhaps they've been in the past. Okay, thank you. Um, and maybe Sam, I'll stick with you. Um, we did a, a, a report earlier in the year, uh, M&A report on what we saw or, or what you know the uh, market saw around the world, key drivers of M&A in 22. And, and, and there was a triarchy of tech, talent, and trade, to what extent do you still see that they will be relevant and pertinent into 2023? Or what other drivers do you think and thematics that will drive the M&A market into 2023? So definitely, I think still relevant for 2023 tech. People will recognize technology is changing, be that the personal technology we use or the technology that we need to become net zero or to clean up operations or, or whatever. So I think technology is still still going to be relevant. We're living in a technology age where it's evolving and to stay ahead, you sort of need to need to keep up at least with what's going on around you. Talent, totally. I think people are recognizing if you don't have the right talent, you're not going to have the strongest business. If you don't have diversity and inclusion in your teams, you're not going to have the best ideas, you're not going to have the best innovation. And so definitely talent very, very high up there. Uh, trade, of course, um, particularly in international businesses, we need, uh, you know, that's that's for sure going to be a business uh, business driver, an M&A driver. I think the one other thing that I'm seeing, particularly, you know, in the sector and the areas that I operate is sustainability. And that's where I'm coming from on that is we are going through an energy transition. So when, when you're looking at deal pipeline, you need to be thinking about, well, what are we looking to acquire? What do we want the business of the future to look like? How do we make sure we're resilient and that we're still a relevant business, as I said, in, in those longer timelines and making sure that any businesses that we do look at, you know, they do have sustainable practices. They do treat people, the planet well. Uh, yet, obviously, you, you know, you have the bottom line, you have, you have the financial drivers as well. But I think um, sustainability and and, and the, the questions that you ask of your counterparties and the due diligence that you do, those are going to be really, really relevant. They are relevant now, but just increasingly so. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I mean, Richard, we were obviously chatting before before we went live and, and you were, we were having a little bit of debate around the drivers and what you saw drivers. And I think you had a thought around as well, sustainability being a theme or ESG one that might be another factor that goes up the... The, the importance, um, but other thoughts that, that, that you have on what are these key themes and drivers into 23? Yeah, I think uh, I, I've read your uh, kind of article on the, the three T's as it were, and I, I echo all of those points really. So from a from a talent perspective, um, as you said in, in your report, you talked about the great, uh, the great resignation post COVID. And from a diligence perspective, if we're looking at businesses, it's very much a focus on, on staff churn rates and availability, because um, we've seen a raft of shortages in personnel across businesses. And just attracting the right calibre of individuals has been quite difficult, to be honest. And it's been a requirement to offer attractive pay and also flexibility to get the people in. Um, and it's just been a really an acute issue as, uh, as we've roared out of COVID and demands caught everyone by surprise, I think. Um, so I, I think there's a potential source of M&A of people acquiring talent to plug that. That's definitely a theme I think that will continue. Uh, from the trade movements, as, as Sam touched on there a little bit, I mean, there's been a raft of supply chain disruptions and trade sanctions. Um, you know, some of our businesses have, have uh, stopped um, supplying Russia as an example, um, and supply chains out of China have been difficult due to the various lockdowns that have been going on. So. I think a lot of businesses are looking at kind of um, self-security uh, to a large extent of their supply chain, and that might be through diversification, so bringing more supplies on board, or nearshoring in some instances. And again, m and is a, a critical factor of that as well, of bringing security and control to your supply chain most rapidly is potentially through kind of acquisition. Um, and finally, tech. Um, and I, I do industrials is my the sector that I covered and we see a lot of kind of old-fashioned manufacturing businesses is what I call them but tech is definitely being an increasingly important component for their growth strategy going forward 
you see the, the large OEM conglomerates, industrial conglomerates of scale, just leaning into software and digital technology to take them to that next step. So again, relevant theme. And then on the environmental theme and keen to Marcus's views around this as well uh, from a consumer lens, but increasingly important, our underlying investors are encouraging us to take a more proactive approach uh, from, a, from an E particularly element. Um, so clearly that goes to scope one, scope two, emissions as kind of a starting place and tracking, et cetera, but it's a lot more than that now. Um, and ch we chatted about a little bit early and kind of B Corp certification across some of our portfolios that are in the midst of trying to achieve that. Um, and I think increasingly the end consumer, be it co other corporates or, you know, Joe blogs on the high street uh, will increasingly look to companies to have that kind of green credential and B Corp certification. Um, I don't know if Marcus would agree from that, from the consumer lens of, uh, of people on the high street. Yeah, I was going to absolutely turn to Marcus. I mean, with that, your with those themes and drivers and and, and the points Richard's made. I mean, with the, your consumer lens and focus, your thoughts on those drivers and and or, and or other key drivers into twenty three. Sure. Yeah, I'd be very interested to comment on that, and I'll comment specifically on Richard's last point uh, first. Uh, there is definitely a degree to which that has entered the consumer psychology and, and the way that they select brands and, and so forth. And, you know, we've seen that over the last five years in particular with the growth of a lot of, you know, emergent uh, brands with very strong ESG type uh, credentials. Um, there is, however, a bit of a tension that we've entered this year, which is, you know, in a in an environment where we have cost of living squeeze, where companies are having to manage significant inflation and you know figure out how to pass that through to a consumer who probably has less money in their pocket, um, while environmental issues are in the you know uh, psychology of the the consumer, the extent to which they ultimately make the decision to buy the more expensive products because it has better green credentials. Um, I suspect that's a sort of smaller group of the consumer base today than it was 12 or 24 months ago. So I suspect we'll see, let's call it a dip or a pause in that overall trajectory, which I agree with you, Richard, will, you know, ultimately, um, you know, in which that will be much bigger uh, part of the market is those kind of very E-orientated um, consumer facing businesses. Um, just coming back on the sort of wider, you know, uh, drivers of moment, I think your your three T's are, are very astute. Um, but I would actually go and Richard use this word uh, something slightly more old fashioned, which is growth, and that is ultimately why people you know pursue acquisitions. And there is there has been a change as well over the last, actually not just this year, but in starting in the back end of last year a shift towards or a, or a return to a focus on profitable growth, not just growth at any, uh, you know, at any cost. Um, and so I think that would be a major driver. People were focusing very strongly on, you know, how is this going to drive the bottom line, not just the top line. Uh, we've seen that in public market valuations. You know, if you look, just take the e-commerce sector, which is one I know quite well, the valuation since November of last year, so well before Putin invaded Ukraine and people started getting really worried about inflation, back in the no November of last year, e-commerce valuations peaked. Their share prices are down 80 to 85% since that point in time because people have really said, hang on a minute, you know, the intrinsic ability for this business to generate profits and cash is more important than its ability to just generate you know, an exciting top line. So that profitable growth, I think, is is fundamental driver. Um, and I think related to the sustainability uh, topic, I think resilience is an important element. You know, people looking to build the resilience of their business, strengthening it, whether that's from a competitive pers perspective, from a, a cash flow or a balance sheet perspective, and thinking about sustainability in its broadest sense. Um, how does this ensure that my business is robust and sustainable into the long term? And then I just had a third point, which is uh, distress and opportunism. You know, there will be a significant amount. You know, there are going to be winners and losers in this dynamic environment. 
and you know those who find themselves on the on the sort of tough end of liquidity squeeze refinancing risk and so forth ultimately become you know, opportunities for companies with stronger balance sheets to uh, to to move in okay interesting thank you um any, I mean, in terms of that distressed market, um, Richard, your your thoughts. I mean, that that sort of restructuring piece going into twenty three as a as a as a theme. Clearly, we've not seen a great uptick. I mean, there are increasingly we've had obviously made dot com uh, recent past um, in, in the news and, and other other retailers. But um, you know, other thoughts from you in terms of that the challenges around that distressed piece into into twenty twenty three. Presumably, there is going to be. Uh, that's going to be an increasing trend and theme. Yeah, I mean, you would you would think so. I think from a, I think the interesting points are um, a lot of the debt that was raised through the last four or five years have got relatively light covenant packages in them. So there may be a period of time actually before businesses actually kind of trip those looser covenants if they have got the covenants in there. And it might actually be kind of liquidity issues that ultimately actually hit some of those businesses as opposed to, to, to covenants ultimately. I think the only thing I'd say on, you mentioned liquidity earlier, just on operating liquidity within businesses. A lot of the businesses are actually in reasonable shape. Um, and I'll say that it on, on two conditions. One, if they've taken advantage of working capital facilities, acquisition facilities over the last four or five years and kind of built that into their financing packages that offers actually a good liquidity cushion for them to help them through this environment. And then secondly, if the companies have been kind of proactive enough to take out the right hedging structure for their interest rates, be it caps or swaps, actually that's probably kind of softened some of the pain a little bit for a wee while until those caps and interest rates kind of run off. So we could have a 12, 24 month period where actually the interest burden on some companies that have been proactive um, isn't as painful as what people are is, is, are, is um, are envisaging. Thank you. Just so uh, change tack slightly. Uh, turn to Sam. Um, we can't obviously. We read every day in the press issues around the you know, geopolitics has absolutely gone to the top of the charts uh, this year. Uh, regulatory issues. We touched on supply chain, but these themes factors, um, particularly that regulatory geopolitical environment your thoughts on on the significance as we go into 2023 that they will continue to be important issues that we need to to think about and confront so i think they will continue to be important issues uh, we will need to confront them but a bit to the earlier point we're better at doing that now uh, business is more resilient to shocks like that so when sanctions in relation to russia came in Yes, we had to do a very quick analysis of where we might have any Russian uh, contact points in all our supply chains in relation to customers in the trading arrangements, but that was actually possible to do. And if you see what I mean, so so yes, we have to be very alive to it, have to be ready to deal with it. But it uh, is something that we're better at dealing with nowadays because it's sort of uh, you know not so unusual. I think the the interesting thing about a business like ours so global diversified commodities is to some extent it transcends geopolitics because we've got so many different jurisdictions so if there's something funny going on in Chile actually it still might be quite stable in South Africa or if there's something going on in you know in China actually we don't have many uh, we've got some um, diamond retail outlets in China but we don't have much trading there even if that's impacted actually we've got a business that perhaps is booming in Brazil. So yes, geopolitics are of course something that we monitor. We've got people who do that. We have country risk groups, et cetera. But usually the business is resilient enough to sort of transcend it. Okay. And obviously as you mentioned you spent time uh, in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, you, you know your thoughts and take on on China and obviously in a very important destination market um for your for your business um what you know your thoughts on the impact on lockdown we're all out of lockdown here in the in in, in the uk and across europe and beyond but in china and asia that impact of, of chinese policy still still quite important but your thoughts on that 
No, exactly. And it, it is still important. And actually, the, the sentiment, I've still got a lot of uh, business contacts and also friends in Hong Kong and in China. And, and it's difficult. And a certain frustration that Hong Kong isn't the kind of, you know, the Asia's world city, as it was, was called. And it is harder to do business. However, what I would say about Hong Kong is it is very resilient. There are a lot of deals makers there, but I think the capital will come from elsewhere. So whereas when I was there, which was sort of 2004 through to 2015, and actually you already saw that shift, there were a lot of inflow from, from maybe European countries or from the US. Actually, the deals potentially now, and actually I saw it, were more local. There were more you know, mainland China, Hong Kong, or Asia type deals. So so yes, it's changed. Um, it's harder for, I would say, companies that don't know China well to do business in China now. And you're right, the lockdowns have had a real impact on people's perception of whether they can grow their business by investing in China. It's a hard, hard place to do business and to do deals well at the moment. Whether that will ever come back, I'm not sure with the current regime and Xi Jinping, it doesn't seem that trajectory is one of opening up to external capital. It seems to be one of becoming more closed. So it's a, yes, it's not the, the, I remember when, even when we had, um, you know, David Cameron and George Osborne, China was the new growth space. It isn't that anymore. But I mean, to your point, you have to remember it's a huge market. A huge market, particularly, you know, and actually, and if I think about commodities, it's got, it's got some critical minerals, you know, lithium and rare earths. And so we do have to be very sensible about how we think about what do what do we need from China too. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, Marcus, when you're talking to clients, um, you know, geopolitics, regulatory issues, supply issues, obviously you, you focused on growth and, you know, it's a theme and a factor of profitable growth and that's key. Um, I get that, but but things that are sensitive. I mean, these are issues that impact and interplay into the M and A market. But how prevalent are they in conversations you're having with 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 clients you're talking to? Yeah, hugely so is is the answer, Richard. And um, in a way that just a few years ago they weren't at all. Um, and actually, just one moment of an advert for Lazard, if I may. Uh, about two years ago, we created a specialist geopolitical advisory group. Um, and it is, oh, it's rather fun actually, it's headed up by uh, a former four-star admiral of the US Navy, a four-star general of the US Army and the deputy direct, former deputy director of the CIA. And, you know, these are people who, well, it's quite fun to have them in the building full stop, but, uh, but suddenly clients are finding their insights and their input, you know, incredibly important and valuable. They're reaching out to us to ask for those opinions, particularly, you know, it's Matthew's spoke very eloquently about China, but that is a critical one. And we do see that, you know, what is really a, in large part a US uh, led, US instigated decoupling of China from the global economy as being one of the major driving factors around, you know, shifts in, in global trade and commerce. Um, I think there's some very interesting, you know, direct consequences for M&A for that. Samantha's spoken about a number of them, about capital coming into or uh, out of China, um, but also you know their ability to acquire the Chinese ability to acquire things outside of uh, of China is extremely difficult now. We've seen that for some time actually with CFIUS in the U.S., where you know we've now reached a point where it is almost impossible for a Chinese company to buy almost anything at all in the U.S. Um, that uh, I'll call it battleground, if I may, it has now moved to Europe. And in fact, I think it's very it's very much worth watching what happens in Germany because Germany will really be the fulcrum of this uh, over the course of the next eighteen months. Um, they have an economy which has been heavily built on exporting services and equipment and technology and so forth to China, and it's been incredibly successful for them for the last twenty years. They're going to have a very big decision to make about whether they continue to pursue that strategy uh, or whether they side with a US led, you know, North Atlantic block. And I think one of the most interesting uh, developments, which was about 10 days ago, 12 days ago, something like that, um, a Chinese 
uh, group was looking to acquire a very small German semiconductor manufacturer called Elmos. And the German authorities, many of you may know, have gone back and forth and back and forth about whether they're going to permit that. Earlier in November, they have uh, blocked that transaction. And I think that is an indication of, maybe not surprisingly, and maybe as a consequence of what's happening in Ukraine and so forth, Germany saying, okay, well, we're going to have to side with the Americans here and create that North Atlantic block. And that is cutting off, you know, frankly, a, a very important tie between Europe and China. That's very interesting. Um, I mean, it's, you know, on that regulatory piece, you mentioned CFIUS. I mean, we see, I mean, so many of the cross-border deals now, you know, regulatory regimes around the world where, um, you know, people are, every sort of regulatory authority, they're concerned of protecting national jewels and, and thinking about what is relevant for that country and supporting and protecting key, key industries and what those key industries are. Um, and the dynamic of you know the interplay across these different groupings whether it be north america europe uh, asia uh, and how that those plates keep shifting um but we live definitely in, a, in an environment with um those regulatory challenges and factors are, are significant i mean richard your thoughts on that i mean when you're thinking you know with I mean, private equity its returns and and growth and and profitable growth i'm sure resonates with you but when you're thinking around your portfolio, thinking about investments, geopolitics, supply chain, you know, regulatory challenges, issues, how do you, how are you seeing that as a house? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're key features at the moment and heightened awareness around them from a, from a, due, diligence, from a due diligence perspective. I'd say, again, just using the industrial sector as an example, we've seen a number of businesses with kind of key component shortages um, where the supply chains just failed fundamentally, um, which has led to absorption of working capital across businesses. So again, thinking about your financing structures for certain businesses and deals, you have got to now got to factor that into your into your mind. And I think the other area of diligence, which is a real focus for us as a result of all this, is it goes back to the start of the conversation as well: inflation and just the ability of the businesses to pass on those supply chain cost increases or disruptions to the underlying customer and pass it down the chain ultimately. And I think from there, you actually see, you know, the true test of the business, the brand, as it were, we talked about a bit earlier, or the, the USP of the customer, such that if the business can push those price rises through, you know, it's a strong testament to the business um, versus those that are kind of suffering and will, will feel the impacts um, of it, I think. So from a yeah from a diligence perspective, I'd say that that supply chain regulatory is impacting as kind of working capital and supply chain and, and price pass through is um, is two areas certainly. Okay, thank you. Um, you met, you touched on brand. I mean, it's something that came out of our uh, M and A report earlier in the year was the importance of significance um, of another factor around people's consideration on on deals and what they looked on for targets. The importance of brand and values. Um, I mean, Marcus, with your sort of consumer focus, but you know that we before this started, uh, we were just debating the sort of next generation coming through, their brand values, their 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 thinking, the the the, the sort of importance of that ethical supply chain, but also the values and brand values that they they attach to, and that next generation coming through, and and how they're starting to influence. Um, your clients and therefore what they're attracted to and, and, and where they're focusing in on, 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 on in the M&A market, interested in your thoughts. Yeah, and you know we've seen uh, over the last number of years, as I said earlier, a lot of emergent brands and uh, you know very vibrant um, venture capital industry evolving in Europe, which has supported the growth of those uh, brands. You know, it's obviously been a very sophisticated venture capital uh, industry in the US for some time, but it really has um, matured uh, in Europe uh, very effectively to help support the growth of those brands. Um, what I think just from a you know, brand perspective, Richard talks about the ability to pass through price. That's tremendously important. And you can see that the valuations of the luxury goods companies who you know, really have an ability to you know, maintain those margins and pass through price and, and have a, a, a customer base, which is 
perhaps a bit less sensitive to to price. Um, you know, they've maintained their valuations in in current environments, and those are still you know attractive businesses. Just saw we've been talking about relatively few large M and A deals happening. Well, we've just seen um, Estee Lauder paying three and a half billion for Tom Ford, for example. That's an indication of you know the resilience and the value of a of a premium luxury brand. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, a flight towards value, I think, is something which we've already started to see. You can see it in the internal trading patterns within, let's take it, you know, the supermarkets, for example, that actually, you know, uh, the cost of Heinz tomato ketchup has gone up by 250% in two years. So they've able to push their price through. Um, and yet the share of private label product on the supermarket shelves or the in terms of their revenue has increased, you know, 15%, 20%, something like that over the course of the last 12 months, as people have traded down from, you know, uh, maybe mid-tier branded product into private label product, which is, you know, pretty equivalent in terms of quality and and cheaper. Um, and I think we'll see that uh, that blown up to a sort of much bigger macro scale in terms of the companies that will do well and, you know, will struggle that actually those companies that are focused on the value end of the spectrum um, provided they can weather the kind of next 12 months or so of this increase of inflation and i think you know the spike of inflation and as that starts to come down i think we'll start to see them absorb quite a lot of customers from a middle market that will be squeezed lost however you want to describe it as the market bifurcates between you know that luxury end of customers who are less impacted and those who are really looking for you know good value for money okay thank you um richard have we lost richard um lost i've lost him on my screen have others lost him on have we lost him on the screen sorry sorry Richard. just in terms of that next generation um you know slightly broader and different take on that sort of brand and value the importance of brand when you're thinking about businesses is is that consideration around what what those values and and, and and interests of that younger generation coming through which do seem to place the importance of or, you know whether it's ethical sourcing value and found brand proposition only seems to be increasing as a, a resonating with that next generation is that is that a theme you you see and it's something you identify with or, or not I think from the brand, sorry, it's traffic in the background. But, um, from the brand proposition, I think it's really important. One of the things we look for in fashion is kind of margin um, and kind of double digit net margins are kind of always a feature of our deals. And brand is, is one example of doing that. Um, we've invested in kind of building product businesses in the past where um, amazingly the brand recognition with that sector is, is incredible. Um, and because of that brand, you do get the pricing power that, that comes with it. So I think absolutely brand is definitely a feature, albeit it can be perceived a bit soft in terms of an IP rich, but it is very powerful. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to turn to, we've got a couple of questions. I'm turn to a question um, for you, Sam. Um, I'm wanting a view on, on Hong Kong and China. And did you, let me just double check the question, but it was, um, Trading styles, Hong Kong businesses being different from that from mainland China. Do, do you use that? Do you got a comment or thought or, or, on that at all? I would say yes, in that the mainland China businesses that I tended to work with or for were state owned enterprises. So often had that element of the government involved sort of behind the scenes, which meant that potentially were not as nimble or the decision making was a lot more complex than some of the Hong Kong companies, be those listed or not. So, so I found, you know, the, the, uh, the way of doing business with a Hong Kong list co was much more akin to doing business with a, with, you know, a, a London listed business. Whereas actually when you were doing deals with China, big business, you had to factor in the SOE element as well. Um, and, and also the, you know, the governance is quite different as I alluded to, could be a lot more complex and you had to make sure you were having the right decision makers and that you actually knew who they were. 
Okay, interesting. Thank you. Um, something we touched on um, again before this session started was um, conglomerates, big multinationals. If the M and A market is a bit of a is going to be a bit of a mixed picture, uh, Richard and Marcus have, have, have talked, um, you know, very interesting observations around that distressed market space. Um, but in terms of large multinationals thinking about value, profitable growth, value creation, or value protection. Carve out, spin out, reorganizations is, you know, ta being led by tax as, a, as often, often a, a, an issue that will push in on, on those sort of transactions, as it were. Is, is that a theme that you would expect to, to grow um, uh, with big multinationals thinking around restructurings and carve outs? I think I think that's right. I think any sort of decent multinational which with a kind of corporate finance or business development department will be thinking about how do we capture value and we'll be looking at the various different ways, you know, be that through m a or be that through a restructure or be that through a partnership or a you know a joint venture or, or whatever so those will always be on the table and given that the m a market is slightly more complex than it used to be, the other types of you know, arrangements get as much of looking as as a traditional acquisition or disposal for, for sure. Um, I mean, Marcus, do you have a, think, a thought of that? I mean, when you're talking to clients and you're thinking of strategies to take to clients and, and pitch for, for business, obviously that's a, it's M&A, but, but in terms of looking at what businesses could be doing to create and drive value, is that, is that restructurings, reorganizations, carve outs, spin outs, is that something that's on the agenda yeah i think um samantha put it very well which is that all large corporates think about that constantly and i think it's really a case of you know continuous optimization of what the portfolio looks like so um yes that's very much uh, a theme with some groups but equally uh, you know of those larger multinationals generally those are the, the ones with pretty stable balance sheets and uh have less push factor in terms of needing to do deals right now. So I think there's probably quite a lot of preparation going on behind the scenes right now that says, well, you know, when it's the better time for us to dispose of this asset, which is maybe not core anymore or isn't driving the top line as it you know once used to. Um, I think that preparatory work is happening now. Um, but most of those large corporates are not in a position where they, you know, need to sell into what is a, you know, a bit more of a challenging, turbulent m a environment that's how i think there might be a bit of a pause and actually people pushing the button on that okay interesting I mean, and i think the same sorry the same probably you get same probably goes for you know those other transaction types you talked about spinning things out and so forth if you're going to do that you want to do that into a really stable you know fairly positive equity market yeah. and spinning something out now and then finding in six months time that the shares have dropped by 15 or 20 percent it just looks bad. Uh, it may not be bad corporate finance, but it looks bad. And so people will think, no, let's just wait until the equity market stabilizes and starts going back up again. I mean, Richard, any comment and thoughts on that? Is that a, a happy hunting ground for you or you, you hope in terms of strategics, carving businesses out non-core and, and, and therefore very much opportunities for private equity to be backing management teams in relation to those sort of transactions? Yeah, absolutely. And um, we've done a series of carve outs in the past and they've, they've proved to be successful ones. It's all around finding the, the right team within those to lead that kind of management buyout of the corporate. Um, I would say you could potentially argue it the other way, actually, in that some of the corporates, I'm thinking kind of dollar denominated large US corporates with cash resources could be on the other way around and actually looking at the UK in particular and seeing it as an opportunity to where market they could acquire into where probably the competitor set for buying those assets is a bit weaker at the moment being the PE environment and it could be an opportunistic opportunistic time for them to kind of deploy some um, some dollars into the the UK market and make that strategic acquisition okay Marcus is that something you're seeing I mean dollar strength um do you do you anticipate the Americans coming calling uh, into the UK and European market yeah, I'll comment on that in just one second. But actually, Richard, you you just tying back one of your comments you just made about, you know, private equity acquiring businesses out of large corporates actually ties back very well to a comment you made earlier, which is about the bilateral compensation. Very complicated carve outs require a huge amount of 
cooperation between buyer and seller. And so those are the types of deals that could happen in that environment where, you know, right, the private equity guys have got to roll their sleeves up and spend six months really figuring out, you know, how we extract that business from the larger corporate. And that's, you know, potentially the type of deal that might happen now. Um, in terms of the dollar strength, and is that, a, a, you know, is now an opportunity for, for US-based and US-funded companies to, um, to come and acquire in Europe? Um, I think there are two sides to that equation. So there's, a, there's one element to it, which is just simply to say, oh, well, the pound is a lot cheaper than it used to be. So, you know, the dollar's gone up, notwithstanding what happened yesterday, the dollar's gone up. So, uh, yeah, it's cheaper to buy stuff in in UK and Europe. Let's, you know, we're going to see them all rushing over the fence. I, I, that aspect of it, I don't subscribe to that view because ultimately that is taking a bet on, well, that currency is going to go up then because, you know, ultimately if you're acquiring a business, let's say it has sterling cash flows, it might cost you less dollars to buy it, but unless the pound recovers, the value of the business isn't going to recover. So that translational element to it, I, I don't subscribe to that view. But there is a very valid point, which I think is underlying Richard's comment, which is that the, the ability to source uh, much cheaper financing in the US is absolutely true. And the borrowing costs for US corporates have not increased anything like as much as they have for UK and European corporates or indeed private equity firms. And so, you know, their strength and strength of their balance sheets and their ability to more cheaply finance transactions, I do think is a reason why, you know, we might see some, you know, US corporates looking to acquire in Europe. Interesting. Thank you. Conscious, we're heading towards the hour. Um, Sam, and I'm going to hold you, you uh, for all of you to, to, to account, as it were, in terms of calling a turn uh, in the market. We talked about lots of factors, lots of drivers, lots of issues, lots of headwinds. Uh, you know, we, the, the title of the session was sort of, you know, when are we going to be able to tame the bear, get back to a, a kind of more positive M&A environment with all of the ingredients and factors we've talked about. When do you see um, that turning point into 2023? And, and, and Mark has talked about that confidence and maybe that kind of pulls all of those factors pulling it together, when's going to be the confidence, when's the market likely to, to get a, 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 a stronger, firmer foundation and, and push upwards rather than be the mixed uh, position we're in today? Well, I think we just have to be ready for another black swan, but I think it will continue, it will trend upwards. I, I'm optimistic that 2023 will be stronger, again, because people are more resilient. People, you know, businesses are more resilient to deal with some of these shocks, be they inflationary or, or otherwise, or geopolitical, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I'm, I'm optimistic. Business are going to have to change. The points that we said earlier about becoming net zero, about the new technologies, and if they're going to survive and be resilient, they need to grow sustainably, and that would involve for some of them some quite significant M&A activity, either for the technology or the talent, or, you know, again, to grab the trade. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Richard, final observations and thoughts from you on that question? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good and tough question to, uh, to answer. Um, uh, it's hard to say when it's exactly it's going to come revert back. I agree with Samantha, it's probably going to be a a journey as opposed to a, an instant switch on but I, I just reiterate i think there'll be opportunity regardless though um as i said kind of there's lots of private equity firms open for business still we're, we're one of them there'll be opportunities unusual ones perhaps that you, you didn't think would crystallize um but are crystallizing as a result of the environment okay thank you very much and finally marcus your your thoughts or or, or what's the, the lazard view uh, well, I certainly won't profess to have the Lazard view, but I can give you my view, um, which, you know, frankly, if it had any merit, I'd, you know, at calling these turns in the market, I'd be a billionaire rather than uh, rather than doing what I do. Um, but I do have optimism about next year. Uh, we spoke earlier about what are the conditions you require for, uh, you know, M&A activity, uh, confidence and certainty around the prospects of businesses. Uh, buyers and sellers to agree so having a relatively st relatively stable valuation environment um, and then you know the availability and cost of capital those are the three drivers that we spoke about earlier on taking you know think about those different um, 
you know, those different factors. I think as we get into next year, uh, barring any other black swan events or crazy activities by Mr. Putin or others, um, you know, inflation will peak uh, during the course of next year. We'll start to lap things like the huge gas price spike uh, that happened uh, earlier this year. And so, you know, just by dint of that, you know, inflation will calm down. I think that will give people a bit more confidence around, you know, what the prospects look like. We'll start to see the effect of um, central bank action flowing through as well. Um, I think as well, you know, that ought to then lead to a more stable valuation environment, which gives you better conditions for buyers and sellers to agree. And also for, you know, lenders to be willing to put their capital at risk. Um, you know, one fact, if you're looking for a, an event uh, that might be a catalyst, I think it's a small one, but I think there's a, you know, w one to look out for is uh, we've had quite a lot of hung financing syndications this year. And so the big investment banks are sitting with some really significant risk on their balance sheet at the moment that they're struggling to get off. Um, once we get past the year end, they will be able to, you know, mark those positions to market and start the new year with a clean slate. And that might be, I don't think it's a starting pistol, but that might just create the conditions to start easing up some of those financing markets a little bit in the early part of next year. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, to Sam, to, to Richard, to Marcus, thank you very much for all of your insights. Um, I thought they were, you know, very interesting and, and, and very informative. And I hope, hope the, um, uh, sort of live and, and, and any other audience that we then you know, in terms of um, you know, that participation um, I hope you've enjoyed this session and got lots out of it I certainly have so my great thanks uh, to all of you as panelists I'll uh, hand uh, back to uh, Alan to wrap us up thank you very much Absolutely. thank you very much Richard uh, thank you to uh, you and to uh, Richard Sutherland you know, for partnering with us on this thank you to Samantha uh, Richard Booth and Marcus and to the audience uh, Please, if you have any further questions, I really encourage you to contact Richard at uh, Evershed Sutherland. And, um, well, I really hope to see you at another webinar shortly. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>